ask the audience if they knew the answer to this question. And now I'm going to ask you if you know the answer to this question. Think back like about a couple of decades. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sure you will recognize it. <laughs> Thank you very much. At any rate, I was working on uh, quantity implicature and its uh, usefulness in modeling questions and question answering system, which I'll say a bit more about in a second. And we were at a Sloan lunch, and I was giving a talk as a nervous graduate student, and Gregory Ward noticed that when I was giving some examples of question answering, I was using a particular intonational contour. And here it is. Did you feed the animals? I fed the cats. So, <laughs> so some of you may realize that uh, what's that, what that means is, pragmatically, that I'm not quite sure that cats is what you had in mind, but this is the answer I have, and you can confirm whether or not um, I'm correct in my assumption. And of course, many of you who know me would know that I probably would say, I fed the cats, because <laughs> for me, animals, the only animals that are relevant, of course, are cats. <laughs> Um, some other examples, I had to choose the answer to this uh, very carefully. Is anyone interesting speaking at the Joshi Fest? Julia's giving a talk. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> and finally, the most relevant, is Erevin really retiring? He says he is. <laughs> So some of you may know, this is a contour is known as a rise, fall, rise contour. Um, and Gregory Ward and I spent uh, almost every Sunday when we were supposed to be finishing our dissertations, but we figured we could take Sunday afternoons off. We would go to one of our two houses and we would work on intonational contours and what they might mean and stay up till about two in the morning and Gregory would have to walk me home because he's very tall. And at the time, it helped to have a really big guy with you if you were walking home at 2 in the morning in Philadelphia. And so this led to a wonderful collaboration um, that lasted over many decades, um, looking at international contours and what they might convey. And it led to me going to Bell Labs and being able to work with Mark and Janet and Mitch and Gregory going off to a very happy career at Northwestern. So, question answering at Penn. We've heard a lot about some of Erevin's interests, but uh, Kathy alluded to some of his interests in question answering, and I think it's really great to see a number of people in the audience who also worked on cooperative question answering, as did I. At that time, I was working on a very interesting phenomenon of how you might use Gricean scalar implicature to model indirect responses to yes-no questions, um, an issue which I may say is still unanswered, um, not even by Siri or by IBM's Watson, which now, of course, we know has solved question answering. <laughs> very nice to know. So an example of this would be, are trains leaving New York on time? Some of them are, implicating not all of them are, or at least I cannot commit to the fact that all of them are leaving on time. And those of you who take trains from New York probably know that that's usually true. So it occurred to me when I was preparing this talk that I've kind of come full circle in a way. I was working on question answering at Penn long ago, then I got into working on other things when I left and went to Bell Labs and AT&T Labs and then on to Columbia. But now, guess what? I'm working on question answering again. Um, <laughs> some of you, maybe Ralph Weishuttle, some of the rest of you um, may know that this is relevant to something called uh, the Bolt BC task. Um, how many people know the Bolt BC task? Just a couple. <laughs> okay, so it's for the three of you who appreciate that task. Um, we're working on something called reprise clarification questions, 
which in a way may seem a, an easier uh, task than how you could generate and interpret uh, questions that uh, rely upon scalar implicature, but believe me, it's still plenty hard. So the goal of this um, endeavor is to construct clarification questions that actually reflect the correctly recognized context of um, an utterance as well as the misrecognition and respond to that. I heard part of what you said, but not all, uh, more like human beings do. So for example, if you have a statement, <laughs> how long have the villagers something or other on the farm, you might want to be able to ask, how long have the villagers done what on the farm? And hope that you will get a useful response. The key is, of course, you have to recognize the words that are misrecognized and what their part of speech is. You have to generate an appropriate question. And not surprisingly, the more words that are misrecognized, the harder the selection of an appropriate question is. For example, uh, if you have how something, have the villagers something on the farm, you could say just what I just said, but what would a normal human being say if they had misrecognized words in those two places? Any suggestions from the peanut gallery? <laughs> what? <laughs> you could say, huh? <laughs> or you could say, what about the villagers and the farm? Which you'd probably rather say. At any rate, there really are some interesting questions, both of, um, well, mostly generation questions, an area that I've never worked in, but Kathy certainly did, was one of the early people to work on. And uh, it sort of brings me full circle back to my pen experience of now working on generation and working on question answering again, among other things. So that's really the only uh, technical-ish part of my talk, and the rest is um, sort of something, some reminiscences and some things that uh, Penn meant to me, and in particular that uh, Aravind did. So people have mentioned kind of science at Penn. Back when I was here and when Kathy was here, and Kathy and Kathy, it was called Sloan. It wasn't called Erx. I'm sorry. Kind of science at Penn for me is Sloan. And I'll never forget the day when, um, I think it was Aravind who invited Martha Pollack and me to actually join the Sloan Cognitive Lunches. We were so honored and so proud because that meant, wow, we were, had arrived. Um, it was, for me, the most wonderful incubator for uh, being a PhD student, even though it was my second PhD. <laughs> it was a lot more fun than my first. Um, which was also fun, but um, it was just so exciting. It was because of the group that uh, Bonnie and Lila and Ervind and Scott and uh, Tony uh, all brought together. And as I forget who said this, I think it was Bob Frank, it really is hard to get a bunch of faculty to meet regularly and actually contribute and you know, come up with good ideas. It's really, really hard. We're trying to do it now at Columbia, and it's really, really hard. So it created lifelong friendships and collaborations, and really it took us into paths we had never, ever expected to explore. I never expected to be involved in speech research, and had it not been for Sloan, that would never have happened. So thanks for that. Now, I want to say something that hasn't been mentioned, uh, I don't think, and this is about Aravind and diversity. So we all thought, Aravind, I don't know if you realize this, but some of us, uh, mostly the female contingent, uh, all thought at um, Penn and CS it was actually an advantage to be female. And that's probably the first time I had ever felt that to be the case, because we thought we were the coolest. I mean, <laughs> quite honestly, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, but <laughs> you came later. Uh, the girls ruled. Uh, we just felt like we were the leaders, and we were just, you know, the best. And that is such a, an unusual and a powerful experience, particularly as it goes on over the years. So that was amazing. And Aravind collected role models. 
Um, he collected colleagues. We had Bonnie. We had Martha Palmer. Um, it was just amazing. So now, uh, part of this legacy is that I think and hope we're all trying to replicate this experience at our own institutions. And so this is my only picture. And it is not from back then. It is from now. So this is the Columbia Speech Lab last summer. And I want you to count. And if you do so, you'll see that the girls still rule. <laughs> However, I have to say, there are a couple of little guys hidden there in the picture. We didn't know that then, <laughs> that they were guys. <laughs> but so it's a little bit more even than it might otherwise be. But nonetheless, I think uh, following Kathy's lead, we all try to uh, get as many uh, women and minorities into our groups as possible. And I'm doing that in large part because Erevin and Penn showed us that it was not only possible, but great. So thanks again for that. Now, now to the, the silly things. So I'm sorry, Ervin, but what I remember from conferences, in addition to the fact that he and Bonnie made it possible for all of us to go, even if we didn't have a paper, you could still go to conferences. And Kathy talked about um, how he would introduce you to people that, wow, you'd think, oh my God, this is you know, somebody whose papers I've read and I'm scared to death and it would just be, oh yeah, you know, talk to them about your work. That was so good. And the, the really memorable things though in addition to that were, um, I remember we were in Washington for some conference. I think it was the first, one of the first ones I went to and Erevin would always take us all out and it was the first time I'd ever had Ethiopian food. I don't know why that's something that sticks in my mind, but it was like, oh, he's opening up new worlds of interesting foods and stuff. Of course, the really, really good one was the strawberry daiquiris. Does anyone else remember the strawberry daiquiri search? <sighs> we were in the elevators of the hotel where the conference was, and they were advertising strawberry daiquiris. And this shows you how long ago this was. No one in the elevator had ever had one. We didn't even know what they were. <laughs> so Erevin says, let's go out for strawberry daiquiris. <laughs> and we spent the rest of the conference kind of going out for strawberry daiquiris. <laughs> it was just so much fun. So Erevin made things fun. And he was great about networking and introducing you to people that you know had mutual interests. And he just made that stuff fun. And now, again, I hope I'm, I'm trying to replicate that with my students, but we don't go out for strawberry daiquiris. That's the only difference. <laughs> Something else, but not strawberry daiquiris. We've had that. OK, I'm going to end with something I call the Joshi question. I think other people have had this experience, but they're thinking uh, Bob Frank at least could answer these questions. For me, uh, no matter what the research topic that I was doing, and most of the work that I've done has not been directly in Erevin's area, although I'm not sure what area Erevin's area is. I think it's the world. Um, Erevin always has a question to ask you with the following characteristics. First, nobody else has asked it of you before about this particular work. For me, sometimes the import of the question was not clear. I wasn't quite sure, why is he asking that question? And for me, again, being slow, uh, it would sometimes take me days or weeks before I fully understood what the question was and the different ways I might try to answer it. I didn't have the answer, but I might at least go about that. But for me, it would, and this happens all the time. Every time I see Erevin, this happens. Uh, so maybe you can help with the reply, reprise clarification questions, Erevin. <laughs> but it produces a whole new way of looking at a problem that I thought I had thought I pretty much understood. And that's one of the most valuable things I think you can do in scientific work, is have somebody who comes up with a question that really changes the way you conceptualize the problem. And Ervin always does that for me. So um, 
I have to say these questions are so unique, I couldn't think of a single one. <laughs> but <laughs> I know they exist, and I know they've changed the way I work. So I've benefited a lot, and so for that, Erevin, thank you so much. You were just a great, great guy. Yes, all questions are answered. No? So are we allowed to ask you about the required clarification questions, or is that off the table? <laughs> ask me anything. All right. So is the sentence about the villagers on the farm, mm -hmm. you had a set of question marks in one place, and then in two places you had question marks. What happens if instead of just hearing nothing, noise, you have actually heard something that turns out to be wrong? Yeah, well, um, you distinguish those two cases, like one place where you don't kind of know what it is at all, and the other place where you make a wrong impression. Yeah, so these are really not, um, these are for um, uh, utterances that are recognized by a speech recognizer. And so the issue is that you have to determine which words the recognizer misrecognized. I mean, it's hearing things, but it's not a human being. And then you have to figure out how to ask an appropriate question that will elicit the information that was misrecognized. Of a human being, yeah. Yeah, I think that the analogy only uh, holds for humans when the human somehow didn't hear the word. Because if you hear some completely different word, right, you probably want to do something really different. Probably give up. <laughs> okay. 